Hello, welcome back to History of Wine and the Vine. I'm Emily Kate. So today's topic is going to be the history of winemaking, which is going to include a bit about fermentation. So I broke it up into five different categories. So we have the thought process behind winemaking, what the ultimate goal was. So today you might think upmarket or kind of more large production. So we have that, a discussion of that. Um, then we have the idea of the press. So we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of the press and what the different techniques were um, that were used in order to press grapes throughout history. Then we'll discuss about fermentation, so the understanding of fermentation and kind of what was done before we understood fermentation. Um, then we'll discuss bottling and then finally maturation. So in terms of thinking about what the goals were, um, when somebody was beginning to make wine, we're going to go back to our good friends Cato Varro and Calumela. So Cato was really into just profit and he was completely profit motivated. He just wanted to make the largest volume um, and just sell to as many people as possible and to him this was just the only reason to have a vineyard was just take advantage of the high price and be able to just make as much as possible. Now, that definitely kind of um, took a bit of a turn around Varro, who was more concerned with longevity. Because at this point, a lot of things were being shipped. So if you were going to be shipping your wine, you had to make sure that the wine was able to withstand the journey. And it was not an easy journey that these wines were withstanding, so kind of the idea of longevity was very important. Then we have Columella, and Columella kind of most resembled his idea behind winemaking most resembled ours today, which is that he was very concerned with kind of the varietal character and preserving the typicity of the wine of a certain varietal, and so that was his main goal. Now, <laughs> now to um, the real <laughs> tangible stuff, which is um, the press. So in the press, I know that we've spoken um, throughout the other videos about a lot of different kind of ways of pressing wine. So there's three main ways and the first one is like the most famous one is the one that I'll discuss um, which is treading uh, with your feet on the grapes and kind of getting the juice out by just stomping on the grapes. Now this was really actually a good way of doing things because you, the soles of your feet are actually soft enough to break the skin of the grape and to get the juice out, kind of the pulp out, but not to break the seed, which contains bitter oils. So this was a really, really smart way of going about this. Um, then we have the sack. So I have a picture here in case anyone hasn't seen the um, Ancient Egypt video. I will find it in just a second. Here we go. Um, here is a picture of the sack being used. So over here towards the end, you can see that the grapes were put into kind of this um, textile. And then um, there would be two kind of rods on the end and they would be spun around and then pulled really tightly. And that would create kind of kind of like we do today with a balloon and a sieve, that it would it would force out the juice and it would keep all of kind of the remains within this sack. That was pretty um, useful. Then we have um, kind of a screw weight um, press. And what that was, here I'll use the book to explain, was that you would have kind of one big weight and there would be a screw on the top of it. and the grapes would be within the treading floor, within the treading basin, they started to call it, because it would have sides. And then you'll kind of gradually lower, lower, lower this weight, this kind of normally wood or something like that, um, onto the grapes. And this would kind of eke out more and more and more juice. And this was interesting because you got into like first press, second press, third press, based on how far down you brought this. and Aside from the first and maybe second presses, it would be pretty nasty because this is, this would break the seed and this would allow the bitter oils to come out. And actually, weird fact is that the peasant wine um, of the Middle Ages was actually just like cubes of this pressed 
must and the peasants would just put it in water because again they didn't understand fermentation which we'll talk about um right now um or actually i'm going to tell you a little bit more about presses and then we'll discuss fermentation but it really wasn't wine it was just like wine must cubes in dirty water which must have been really gross for them um but let's quickly discuss uh the evolution of the press i have kind of a cool um couple series of images to show you which might help un might help you to understand um how the press evolved so first of all and this book is fruit of the vine viticulture in ancient israel by carrie ellen walsh so first and i hope you can see it we have a fairly simple um just a treading floor and then kind of a um tube that goes to a collecting vat then as we move through time um, we have a holding oop over here. We have a holding basin up at the top, then the treading floor, and then the tube that goes to the collecting vat. Then you kind of see now we have two treading floors, four collecting vats, four tubes going to the collecting vat, and then a holding bin. So as you can see, it was kind of simply it was a very simple concept, but it definitely evolved throughout time to be more complex. So these would be literally just cut into the bedrock. These were not constructed, so to speak, in the sense that they didn't bring out materials to do this. They actually took away. So these were right into mountainsides. And actually, for a lot of them, they would have to plaster over. Because let's say you had something like limestone or some kind of permeable stone. You couldn't press grapes on it because the grape juice would just seep into the stones and then you would lose it all so they actually had to plaster over these things um so that's kind of a bit about um the presses and the different ways that you could press things um and then now let's move on to fermentation probably the biggest leap that had been made was the understanding of fermentation so before kind of the mid 1800s when louis pasteur figured out what fermentation was nobody had any idea they were just kind of letting things happen as they had for centuries and nobody had any understanding which meant nobody had any control at, at all so i actually have a kind of cool quote here um which can give you an idea of just how confused people were um so we have this is by emerine this is about fermentation it remains an empirical process, subject to the variation of nature, with man exercising, at best, only partial control. So there were two main things that people knew. They knew that if they tread on grapes and left the juice alone, it would ferment, it would turn into wine. They didn't know the, the name fermenting. Um, and they also knew that if it had too much contact with oxygen, with the air, that it would taste unpalatable. So it would kind of just taste gross. Um, so they knew these two things, but had no idea what was going on within um, the vats that they were kind of letting fermentation naturally happen in. So nowadays we call this ambient yeast, and kind of the ambient yeast that was already on the grapes would actually break down the sugars. So Louis Pasteur actually figured this out um, at the request of Emperor Napoleon III, who wanted to know why so much wine was just going bad before he could drink it. So we have him to thank um, for kind of encouraging and making Louis Pasteur um, publish these results. And so Louis Pasteur figured out um, the products of alcoholic fermentation, he figured out the role of yeast, um, the difference between aerobic and anaerobic. Um, he really he really clarified a lot for people and then from there people were able to kind of say okay now we understand what's going on and for instance now we use sulfur dioxide to halt the um, natural, the ambient yeast and the fermentation that happens naturally and we inoculate with cultures that are made specifically to make sure that things are consistent and we get the qualities that we want out of the fermentation process. So the kind of wines that we make today would have been impossible without the fermentation expertise that Louis Pasteur gave us. So thank you, Louis Pasteur. Um, and so now we have um, bottling to talk about. So of course, bottling has not always been bottling. I guess it was called amphora-ing um, because Bottles for wine were not really, that was not a great idea because until the 17th century when you had coal burning furnaces, 
glass was not thick enough or dark enough. It just wasn't sturdy enough for wine to be shipped in. So it just wasn't an option. So people would put wine in barrels, um, before that in amphora, and then only recently um, have people been putting wine in bottles. Um, and something that I thought was really cool, and I saw this a really long time ago, I got all excited, so I found it for you again. Um, this is an ancient Egyptian siphon. It's on my computer, I hope you can see. And I don't know who is watching this, but um, I've actually had some experience in wineries and we use the siphon just like that nowadays in new world wineries, which I think is really crazy. So you can kind of take, and this is within the conversation of bottling and things like that. Um, if you have, it's kind of the use of gravity. So if you have one kind of vat and then you have another empty vat, if you take like a long tube and you can actually move without like pouring and kind of ruining everything, you can actually move the liquid from one to the other by putting a siphon in, so putting like a long tube, and then you kind of like get it started and you kind of suck on the tube this way, and then you put it into the new vat and it transfers um, the liquid based on gravity. So I just think it's really cool that things that people were using in ancient Egypt were still using today in like the most tech savvy wineries ever. Um, at least I think so. Um, so I thought that that was pretty cool. And then that also kind of leads us to our last topic for the day, which is maturation. So maturation didn't really become widely popular until after bottles were kind of de rigueur. So people were not necessarily, they understood vintages and they understood that certain years produce certain better wines, but it wasn't about oh, this wine will do great in, you know, 20 years. They had cellars, but they weren't necessarily cellaring for the purposes of kind of maturing their wines and having them at a later date. They were just kind of keeping them underground and trying to keep them palatable, um, as we've discussed. So it's kind of um, a long journey that we've all been on in the winemaking process, but I think we can all agree Louis Pasteur really helped us out on that one. Um, so I hope that you enjoyed today's little lecture, um, and I hope that you learned a bit about the winemaking process throughout history, and I will see you next week. Cheers!